we're just looking within one second, and then when we're looking at the escape response, it's much less than what's happening within a second. And then these lines are showing you what is the sarcomere length at different positions along the fish length. So when the fish is just cruising, and we're looking at the anterior part of the body, oh wait, I get um, you can see you know, what I said about this along the fish length, that's incorrect. Um, if we're looking at just the anterior part of the body, you can see it doesn't really move a whole lot, right? When a fish is swimming, most of the, how a fish propels itself is really like a whip action, right, with, with its tail. Um, not so much with, with the anterior part of the body. There's a little bit of the muscles. You can see there's a little bit of change with the sarcomere length, and it's right in that sweet spot, right? Maximum overlap, um, which gives you the contraction. Mid-body, a little bit more deviation from kind of that dotted line that it's, you get greater shortening and greater lengthening. And then when we look at the posterior, it's even more pronounced, the, the shortening and the lengthening, because the animal is contracting the muscles more in its tail than it is in the anterior part of the body during steady swimming. But when we look at the escape response, it's much different. Here you can see the sarcomere um, length decreases dramatically in the anterior part of the body, a little less in the mid-body, and even less in the posterior part of the body. And that's because when the fish really wants to escape, it kind of jackknifes jack knife, jack knife itself. And then that really allows, because when it does so, it's stretching the muscles on the opposite side. And we talk about there is still some force there. When you stretch it, you really got one picture that had like little springs on the end. Because mm -hmm. what wants to happen is it wants to go back to normal. So if you stretch it a lot, not only are you getting the energy from the contraction of the, um, the overlap of the actin and myosin, but you're also gaining positive energy by the recoiling of the kind of spring-like proteins, the actinin. And so by stretching it a lot, then it really can whip itself and can um, result in a very large amount of force generated, which can uh, propel the fish to escape um, or even to, to chase a, a prey item. And again, just needing to look at, you can see the relative time scale they're showing here, but it's really, you can see how quickly this occurs. And you can see that jackknife position. You can see this is where, how the length of the sarcomere at this particular point. All right, work loops, we're gonna, this gets into really more detail of what I was talking about with the stretching on one side, the contracting, and it, it, we'll just skip that for now. But if we look at two different types of fish, we look at that pike, which is the accelerator, and then our cruisers. And I talked about how pike kind of lie in wait when they want to attack a, a prey item. So they're an accelerator. So they really can whip their body to get a per, generate per, tremendous amount of force to move it very, very rapidly or quickly after a, a prey item. A lot of white muscle. Where our cruisers, the mackerel and the tuna, they have quite a bit of red muscle. So these guys can generate high force for a very brief amount of time. These are highly efficient and continuous. And if you go back at the, the last two slides we looked at on, on Wednesday, when we looked at compared white muscle to red muscle, right here, the red muscles are gonna be found in our cruisers, a lot of mitochondria, a lot of blood, so very rich blood supply, and so forth. So then if we take a cross section of these animals, and you can see, it's basically all white muscle in the accelerator. But when the cruisers, you can see it has quite a bit of, of red muscle, but it also has some white muscle. And again, the white muscle is for that burst of speed, you know, if that the cruiser is going after a prey item. Because these cruisers are, they're not someone's prey, right? They, they are top line predators. I mean, sharks don't go after them, and only your fishermen go after them. So just pay attention, we'll, we'll see it here. So if we look at the mackerel, its red muscle is farther away from the spinal cord. Whereas the tuna, its red muscle is right along the length of the spinal cord. And they 
have um, both positives and, and negatives for this uh, arrangement. Um, and we'll look at those. Um, so we are looking at, again, just different animals, the yellowfin and the skipjack tuna. Here and we're looking at the, along the length of the animal for both of them and where the red muscle is. And you can see with this yellowfin tuna, its red muscle is more superficial. It's closer to the exterior of the body. Whereas with the skipjack, you can see that it's going to be more internal. So why the difference? So why put red muscle on the inside? Why do you want red muscle on the inside? Where is what do we know about um, the temperature of, of tuna? <laughs> Go back. They get pretty they're, hot, don't they? They're what? They get pretty hot, don't they? They do. So what's... Oh, where go? What are disadvantages? All right, we'll talk about disadvantages first. So here's the backbone, and then here's the muscle, red muscle. What's the disadvantage of having red muscle so close to the spinal cord? Doesn't get a lot of leverage? Yeah, very little leverage. The thing I talked about is, you know, if you have a, a rusted nut and you're trying to open the nut with, by using a, a wrench, but if you get a very, and you can't, but if you stick like a metal pole on it, you make the fulcrum length really long, just a little bit of effort, and you can um, get the nut loose. So mechanical red muscles closer to the vertebral column have a very low mechanical advantage. Right, so it just takes more energy to basically result in the same amount of force being generated as if the muscle was on the outside. The advantage of it, so if you can move it farther out, you end up with, again, you can generate le more force with, with less effort. So what's an advantage of having the red muscle on the inside? It's warmer. It's warmer. And what do we know about, what is a muscle contraction? What type of reaction is it? It's a chemical reaction, right? So if it's warmer, the chemical reaction is going to occur faster. So you can get away with having a very short or very low mechanical strength or low small fulcrum length if the muscles are really warm. Because if the muscles are really warm, they're gonna be highly efficient because they're warm. And so inner muscles are gonna be warmer than the outer muscles. And so they both, they're both good, right? If you're an animal that has your red muscle on the outside, just because now you have a larger fulcrum length, when they contract, they're much more, they're efficient that way. Whereas if your red muscles on the inside of the animal and your fulcrum length is short, well, the advantage there is you're nice and warm, so the chemical reactions are going to happen much more rapidly. So warmer muscles going to contract faster. Um, let me see. Do I want to talk about this? Yeah. So fact, we know that chemical processes get faster as temperature rises. We know that muscle contraction is a chemical process, so muscle contracts faster as temperature uh, is going to rise. Um, faster contract, there we go, argued from biology, faster contractions can increase tail beat frequency, and the swim speed increases with tail beat frequency, so the fish is gonna swim faster as the temperature rises. There we go. Argued by physics, I'm not going to get a whole a lot of it, get into this much, is that power, right, that's what's important, is how much power is actually generated. And it's going to be the force times the speed of the contraction. So how much force the muscle contraction creates, and the speed of that muscle contraction is going to generate your power. So faster contractions means more muscle power. Fish has more thrust. As this uh, and swims faster as the muscle temperature rises, but again, it doesn't mean that just because you're, um, if you have muscles on the outside, doesn't mean you're inefficient. You are. You just have sacrificed the advantage of temperature in lieu of having a larger fulcrum length. What this is looking at really 
to take home from this is here we're looking at power, tail beat frequency, so how fast the tail is beating. And you can see as you increase the temperature, you increase tail beat frequency and results in more power. Right? That's basically what that figure is just showing. So more muscles produce extra speed and, and power. Kind of that's all I want to talk about with um, kind of the temperature and the fulcrum length. So there's at some point, right, muscles at some point can no longer contract any faster, right? There's an upper limit to muscle contraction. Yet we have, there's some muscles out there that contract very, very rapidly. Um, they're known as these sonic muscles um, or sonic fibers. The, any of you work with Dr. Mueller? Right, you talk about um, the little bladder wart, right? You, you're not thrilled with those things. Mm -hmm. At least I saw it in Yeah. But it, it's one of the fastest muscles out there. Um, there's some other ones that are really, really fast. Um, in like the Venus flytrap, which I know it seems like that's not muscles. It's, um, there's some uh, fish that feed by the way most fish feed is they create a negative pressure in their mouth by opening their mouth very rapidly because what that does is by you remember go back to the days when we talked about you increase volume you decrease pressure so they can rapidly open their mouth and what happens is the prey gets sucked into the mouth those fish have really fast um, sonic fibers in their in the muscles in their jaws Unfortunately, we don't. We don't have those. So if we look at, we're looking at how much free calcium there is when we're looking at um, red fibers and these sonic fibers. Again, you need to pay attention to the x-axis. Here we're looking at seconds, and here we're looking at, at milliseconds. And this is looking at, again, like I said, calcium, because calcium really is driving whether the muscle is going to contract or not. Yes, you need ATP available, but as being an animal that's alive, ATP is always going to be there. So it's the calcium that's regulating how fast a muscle can, muscle can contract. So that's the key. So here we're looking at, you know, you muscles contracting, then, I mean, calcium's released, you get a muscle contraction, and then calcium is being rapidly pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And you can see the force that's being generated. It basically stays constant along the entire time. Basically, you're stimulating the red muscle fiber to contract. When we look at um, the sonic muscle fibers, very initially, you have a very large spike in free calcium levels. And then it drops back down. And then you end up with, each time there's a, an action potential, you end up with just smaller free amounts of free calcium levels. And you can see that the muscle contraction initially is high, it drops, and then it slowly increases again. And it says, I don't think I forgot to put some of my notes that had some more information on this. I think. Oh, no, there's a have this. Okay. So what we see here with these if you look at um, kind of the calcium kinetics, if you look at the red fibers versus sonic, here relatively the calcium pumps are relatively slow. And that's why the muscle can only contract at that rate of speed, because you have to clear the calcium out of the, out of the cytoplasm. Whereas sonic fiber types, their calcium pumps are very fast. Or very, yeah, very fast. Then another muscle that contracts at an extremely high 
rate of uh, very high frequency are these um, muscles found in the mid shipman um, they're known as mid shipman vocal vocal so these midshipmen fish are pretty weird. Um, they have two types. There's a type one male and a type two male. Type one male is big. It's the one that attracts females. The type two male looks like a female and is known as a sneaker or a satellite. And so the type one male, which is nice and big, he's made himself a little nice little nest. He's attracting these females that look about this size, female, female, but then you have, so this is type one, and then you have a type, I can't draw the fish the opposite direction, can I? Then you have the type two male, that looks, well it's too fat, that looks like a female. Yeah. Okay, I'm just like the, I'd like, abstract for two seconds. Are you talking about blue, like sunfish? Mid-shipment fish. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry. There's other, there's a lot of fish that have these sneaker types. I don't know about bluegill. Um, I just know more about reef fish. Um, so these midshipmen, like I said, the male is making these noises, and the noise it makes to attract these females And it can go for like two hours. <laughs> but it makes them by contracting um, contracting muscles around the swim bladder. So it's basically moving, shaking that sack of air that creates that weird noise. And, you could Google it. it, it's not really exciting. You, it literally sounds like. <laughs> and it's, these muscles contract at a very, very high frequency in order to make that noise. And the fact that they can continue to contract for several hours, they're, they're very efficient, but they also do it at a very, very high rate of frequency. So they're very similar to these sonic um, muscle fiber types. Like these, what we see here in the, in the purple. All right, here we're looking at free calcium levels, and then there is looking at the actual force that's being generated. The force is the same, whether it's a, a sonic, a white muscle, or a red muscle, right? because they're all working via actin myosin filaments overlapping each other. It's just the time needed to reach maximal force. All right? Sonic muscle fibers do it in, in milliseconds. White muscle, a little bit, um, a little bit longer, but red muscle, look really that takes, you know, almost half a second to, um, not half a second, 500 milliseconds, so, yeah, half a second. And then here we're looking at with the free calcium levels is how quickly they're able to um, get calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which then allows them to release calcium again very, very rapidly, which allows for the muscles to contract very quickly. So that's dealing with muscle, but then why the two different males? Um, I talk about this in my endocrinology class. Is so this male, known as a satellite or sneaker, is as a female comes swimming over here to lay her eggs he'll dart in and fertilize them, and then dart out. Um, and I, I don't know why, well, because my, I, have a, I have a potty brain, that's why I like to think about this, is when I was giving my dissertation, there was a guy from um, the Netherlands who was giving a talk about sneakers, and he was looking at reef fish, and he called them sneaker fucks. <laughs> and all of us just stopped, like, did he just say what we think he just said? And sure enough, that's literally what they're doing. They sneak in <laughs> and have, fish really don't have sex, right? The female drops her eggs, the guy comes over and fertilizes them. Um, but that's, 
what, what they do. So we still talk, we still haven't got to the point where we reach tetanus, where the muscle can no longer contract. We've talked about these fast sonic muscle fiber types. They're still able to contract. They don't reach this tetanus where basically they're, they're just locked. So what we're looking at here is from a single twitch, so just one action potential is sent down the neuron to the um, motor unit. And so we're just a single um, yeah, just from a single action potential. So here's your action potential. There's a tiny little lat um, latent period between the action potential and the actual generation of the force being generated. And that's because it takes time for calcium to leave the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It takes time for calcium then to wander over to troponin C and to bind to it, and then to expose the myosin binding sites. And that's why we have this um, latent period. And this is typically what you know we see. And this is even occurring, if you notice, there's no time frame on the x-axis here, because this happens for sonic muscles, white muscles, and, and red muscles. But at some point, you know, Looking at relative tension, and when we switch a single action potential, we get a twitch. Right? Low frequency action potentials, this is what we get. Just low frequencies, right? But at some point, at very, very high frequencies, you reach tetanus. And so that means, I mean, if it's just what it is, like the bacteria of tetanus, right? It forces your muscles to lock. But that's due to a bacteria, right? Tetanus? Yeah, for, from a bacteria, whereas, I mean, we, at extremely high frequencies, you can get this, but I can't think of an example off the top of my head of where this happens biologically. I don't know if any of you, I don't know if Dr., not Dr., uh, Karen, Children. children. Yeah, children. Mm -hmm. Not children. Yeah, I'm just gonna children. Yeah. Karen <laughs> talked about that. You, know, you took anatomy with her. Did she talk about a muscle ever reaching tetanus? Talk about love a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I can't remember anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> that. That's good. Huh? <laughs> yeah, that, that happens. <laughs> Is that what you can do in this class too? Probably. No, that lab was bad. That lab yeah. was torture. Yeah. yeah. Keller, relay the message. <laughs> it's, no, we, I, that's why you know, students that think, oh, I'm going to take anatomy and fit, be ready for med school. I'm like, do you really want to do that? Because that's, it's like the two toughest courses in the biology department. That's why you're taking the closest community. Yeah. Way yeah. easier there. And yeah. med schools don't require the only way. For those of you who want to be physician assistants, yeah, you have to take anatomy and phys. I don't know about dental. Pharmacy school, I don't think you have to. But basically, honestly, that, those two classes are the leader classes for the nursing department. That and physical therapy. So we end up, we see muscles that actually con contract so fast that if, if they relied upon an action potential, they would reach tetanus. I don't know if that's going to make sense. Because they contract faster. How fast they contract should result in a tetanus, but it doesn't because they're not dependent upon an action potential. It's not a one-to-one -one ratio. One action potential, one muscle contraction, or one twitch. And these are known as these indirect flight muscles. And we see these in insects that have extremely fast wing beats. Um, do I, do I, do I have some numbers for you. Okay. So to move really fast, <laughs> Muscles have these stretch, they're stretch activated muscle contractions. 
to be active. And these are basically they call them indirect and uh, I have it written somewhere else. So if we look at uh, right down fast and these muscles go. <coughs> Um, so indirect and also known as asynchronous. So the way these muscles work is in, in lab. So what they did is they basically took an insect, took its muscles out, flight muscles, stuck it into a saline bath, and they attached. They fixed one end of the muscle to a fixed. Um, fixed site and then they attach the other end to a pendulum. And what they did is they just move the pendulum and they just let the pendulum swing. And that stimulates muscle contraction. Just the stretch, just stretching it causes the muscle to contract. And the way they kind of looked at this is, so here's just the normal tension and just by stretching it, Calcium levels are released, and then after they're released, they're pumped back in, released, released, pumped back in. So they actually are able to see that just stretching induces calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So stretch active muscle contractions, the stretching activates calcium release. So no action potential is required, but I put an asterisk there because in the animal, to get it started, there has to be an action potential, right? A bird, a, an insect ready to fly, how does it get going, right? It has to actually have an action potential to start the muscles contracting. And action potentials are um, sent at a, an interval to keep the muscles contracting because at some point they just can't rely on contracting stretching contracting stretching they it will decrease over time so there's an action potential that comes to keep them at that frequency sorry i missed that okay. sorry you know fuck you siri okay. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. Uh, what do you mean siri what, how can i help you <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, let me try the damn Fritos. It's too hot for me. <laughs> That's what she said. Let Dr. Riley eat your Fritos. All right, so direct muscles. We know, we've really been talking about direct muscles, right? An action potential, muscle contraction. It's a one-to-one -one ratio. And so for these insects, they have like a dragonfly, um, they do not have extremely high wing beat frequencies. So they use direct muscles. They have elevators and depressor muscles. And so these are the elevators because they're in this weird color here. And you can see they're attached here. And what that does is that's bringing the wing up, right? So it's elevating the wing. Then you can see you have a depressor here, which is then gonna pull the wing down. Right, so it's just, it's kind of like our um, biceps, triceps, right? The, we don't activate by stretch, by contracting our biceps and stretching the tricep. That does not stimulate the tricep to contract, right? We have to send an action potential, and that's what's happening here. Now these indirect muscle fibers that we see in flies and, and bees is you can see how they're attached. See, this is different. They're attached to actual little um, hinges. Whereas here with the indirect, 
they actually compress the carapace of the fly or the bee. And so when these, you have a set of muscles that are going to contract. And if you see, as it, these are contracted, you can see how the carapace has been squashed, right? And it's squashed these opposing muscles, right? They're just opposing. You don't have necessarily <laughs> elevators and depressors in these insects. You would just, they're kind of opposing. You know, one is, sorry, they're not opposing muscles. It's just one's being contracted, the other one's being stretched. So here we're contracting it and it's stretching these muscles here. And then due to that stretching, it's gonna cause these muscles to contract, which then stretches these muscles, which then causes the carapace to go from this shape to this shape. And that moves the wings. So it's the movement of the actual carapace that is moving the wings up and down. But the movement of the carapace is happening as a result of the muscles contracting and they're stretch activated. So these contract, stretches these, causes these to contract, these contract, stretches these, causes these to contract, and it just keeps going. But again, it doesn't happen for the entire flight time of the insect or the fly or the bee. You, they do send action potentials at set time to keep that frequency going. Does that make sense? And so another way of looking at it, um, here's our damselfly. So these are the, how oh, they do call them depressors, sorry. These are the direct muscles, right? They're attached to this pivot point, right? The elevators are gonna contract, it brings the wing up. And then the depressors are gonna contract, bringing the wing down, right? There's that hinge point. And I do apologize, I did, they, these weren't elevators and depressors. Um, they are. But here we're looking at the elevators are gonna contract, and you can see that causes basically the flattening of the thorax. It's not the entire length of the insect doesn't get squashed, it's only where the wings are attached. So it flattens it and lengthens the thorax, which stretches then these depressor muscles. They're gonna be caught, that that's going to cause them to contract because they've been stretched. Now they contract, they're going to bring the wings down because now it's basically kind of squishing the thorax in the opposite direction. And again, these just, they cycle back and forth. So if we look at the synchronous or direct uh, muscles, there's a one-to-one -one relationship between a nerve impulse and a contraction. Wing beat frequencies up to a thousand, I mean, sorry, a hundred hertz. You know, cockroaches, locusts, butterflies, moths, dragonflies, and cicadas. So insects that don't really flap their, their wings that fast. These indirect, they have a very low frequency of action potentials that arrive at the muscles. Again, it's just to keep the frequency of the muscle contraction going at the speed it needs to be because they're stretch activated. Muscles continuously activate and oscillate at a frequency set by the properties of the muscle and the load on it. So it's not set by the properties of the action potential. It's the properties of the muscles themselves. How fast are their calcium kinetics? Right, that's a big one, is the, the, the rate of calcium kinetics. How quickly can they pump calcium back into, um, into the sarcoplasmic reticulum? Now mind you, these are not, in these insects, they are not sonic muscle fiber types, because sonic muscle fiber types are a one-to-one -one ratio, one action potential, one muscle contraction. So that's, they're different, but they can both go at very, very high frequencies. These um, stretch activated muscles actually can contract at a faster frequency than the sonic muscle fiber types, because they're not dependent upon an action potential. Because an action potential, there's a lot going on right to get a muscle to contract via an active potential it's just not a neuron stimulating just the muscle you have to think about the entire neuron right the neuron there's a it's not just one neuron it's multiple neurons it's not a multiple amount of neurotransmitters being released 
that have to bind to a receptor on the postsynaptic neuron. And then that has to be strong enough to go from a graded potential all the way to the axon hillock to generate an action potential. Then you have the pump sodium potassium, right? Then it gets down to the terminal end, releases its next neurotransmitter. So that takes time. Whereas if you can eliminate all that, the muscles can contract at a much faster rate. So here we can have wing beat frequencies above 500 hertz. So bees, wasps, um, and most true bugs. Yeah, so a unique property, I think we'll, we'll end here, um, that length changes imposed on them when activated causes changes in tension only with a, with a delay. Um, as a result, a pair of activated antagonistic muscles, let me talk about this, there has to be a slight delay. And that's to basically finish the movement of the wing. Right, if you want it to be fully stretched, they have to be fully stretched, not just partially stretched to contract. So if it's only 50% stretched, it's not gonna contract. It has to be all the way from stretched. But that also has to then ensure that the wing muscles, or the wings have been, or have been fully, have moved their full range of motion. So there's, that, there's a very, very slight delay. Um, as a result, a pair of activated antagonistic asynchronous muscles automatically go into these length change oscillations. The key property for these is that myosin ATPase activity is length dependent. Right? It's the myosin ATPase is length dependent. It's dependent upon the length of the sarcomere. And that's going to induce whether myosin is going to be um, act as an ATPase or not. And like I mentioned um, Wednesday is, yes, we, there's more than one myosin filament. Right? There's more than one actin filament in our muscles. It depends on which muscle we're looking at. Some are going to have very, very rapid myosin ATPase activity, where some other muscles have, very, have relatively slower myosin ATPase activity. All right. Oh, one more. Oh, and then one. Any particular contraction at any particular contraction frequency, asynchronous muscles are more efficient than uh, synchronous muscles. A lower cost of of calcium transport. And we're gonna stop there. I do have a 